depth of my soul in the flood or the fire you are with me i have this
difference it could make if we go out from here living like this is true, with confidence our past is erased, our future is secure, and there's peace in time of pain. to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine according to his power at work in us to be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and all God's people said amen God bless you God bless you Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
welcome to a celebration of life of a great man of God. I just want to start out by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for your presence and your patience. I'm reminded of a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, where the scripture says that God comforts us as we comfort others. And so we're thankful that you're here. So no matter where you are, whether you're here in the worship center or whether you're in other areas of our building, you're here to not only uh, pay your respects and celebrate this great man of God, but we're here for each other. We're here to comfort each other. So we thank you so much for your presence. Many of you know that Pastor Gay would have wanted this to be a truly a celebration of his life. Not only the celebration of life that he lived here with us, but a celebration of the life that he's living right now with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's right. You know, he would have told us that it's okay to grieve, and he would have told us it's okay to mourn. But we're going to grieve not as those who have no hope, because we know where he is. So it's okay to cry and mourn today because we truly will miss a great man of God but let some of those tears be tears of joy because we know where he is so at this time I'm going to ask that Dr. Jared Alcantara will come and give us a prayer of comfort and then following after that we'll have words of comfort by Pastor Dean Vanderweel Good morning. My name is Dr. Jared Alcantara, and I had the privilege of serving on staff here at Central for nearly five years. It's good to be with you, and I invite you to pray with me. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. O oh God of all comfort, would you come near to us now as we grieve, as we weep, and also as we celebrate a life well lived to the glory of God. Jesus, you know what it's like to experience sorrow. But the scriptures say that you were a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You know what it's like to weep tears, to experience heartache. And you even know what it's like to feel alone, to feel hurt, to feel deep sadness. But Jesus, you also know what it's like for us to experience these things. You know what it's like for us to feel like we're in a storm, to feel like we're hurting, to feel like we're struggling just to make it through. But what you say to us during times of sadness and weeping is that you will be with us in the storm. You will sit there in the boat with us and say to the storm, peace, be still. For because you are in the boat with us, we do not need to be afraid. You are also a God who walks with us in the furnace, who walks with us through the furnace. And so, God, even though you are one who knows what it's like to experience sorrow, you also know what it's like to walk along those who experience sorrow. And so, God, would you walk with us now? Would you comfort us in our hurt and in our heartache? And would you remind us that we do not grieve as those who have no hope? We pray for Pastor Gay's family, for his wife, Kim, 
for their beloved children, for his siblings, for the many family members, his mother, the many family members who are here. God, would you sit with them in the boat? Would you walk with them through the furnace? God, would you give them strength for each day? Just enough strength to make it through. Would you help them, Lord, even now in their grief, to know that for Pastor Gay, faith has turned to sight and prayer has turned to praise. Lord, I pray for each person gathered here. Would you give us all strength as we mourn and as we grieve? Would you give us healing in the midst of our hurt? Would you give us strength to face each day? Be with this church. Be with these people. Thank you that you are a God who says to us that you will bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. For those who are far from you, I pray that this would be the occasion where they're brought near. And for those of us who walk with you and continue to walk with you, would you remind us as well that one day faith will turn to sight and that prayer will turn to praise and that that which is perishable will give way to that which is imperishable. For not even death can stop the plans of God for new life. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray this all in the strong and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and let the church say, amen. Good afternoon. I realize that um, most of you do not know who I am, but I've known Richard for over 40 years. We were students together at Lancaster Bible College. Our first ministries were both in Western Pennsylvania. We took our first seminary classes together and because of my wife's matchmaking abilities, he became my brother-in-law. <laughs> and right there, God has a sense of humor. My responsibility this morning is to share some words of comfort. All week I've been thinking about what do I share? And to be honest, I got nothing. There's nothing I can say that would help. So what I want to do is I, I want to just share the scripture passages that, that God has just been flowing through my mind and my heart all week. Passages that, that God has ministered to me and, and my hope and prayer is that they minister to each one of us. For example, Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, throughout Scripture, we have this, this picture of, of everything about God being light and everything about Satan being dark and darkness. God is our light. And as we sit here and we're, we're going through all the emotions, God is the light at the end of the tunnel. He is there for us. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Now, I realize God is everywhere present. I understand God's omnipresence. But David's not talking about that in this verse. When he talks about God being an ever-present help in trouble, he's talking about the fact that, that God is certified. He has proven himself to be a help. Now, I'll be honest, I'm one of those guys who like to do everything myself. And I wonder why things happen 
but Wednesday our sewer grinder stopped working and I couldn't fix it. I had to call a professional. I had to call the expert. I had to call someone certified. Our God is that certified help for us, even now as, as we face uncertainty. Our brother prayed or mentioned in his prayer, Psalm 147, verse 3 and 4. He heals the brokenhearted, binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Now, in my little organized mind, these two concepts don't fit. You know, brokenheartedness, and what does that have to do with stars? But think of this. Our God who placed the stars in the sky, who, who named every one of them. Our great God is here now to bind our wounds, to heal our brokenheartedness. Isaiah 41.10. Actually, it's my favorite verse. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. As I said, this is my favorite verse. It's been mine for probably 30 years. In the last two months, this verse has taken on new meaning for me. I have a 14 month old granddaughter. She still likes to crawl up on my lap and drink a bottle. There's one problem. She must hold it herself. If I hold the bottle, she shushes my hand away. And what she does is she grabs hold of that bottle with both hands. And as soon as she has it securely in her mouth where she wants it, she lets go of one hand and searches for mine and holds a finger. And even as she's drinking it, she'll come to that place where she needs to change hands and, and she'll, she'll grab it with both hands, she'll get it steady again, and, and she'll let go with the other hand and find my finger to hold on to. This verse has new meaning for me. God is a, a source of security. And he is there for us to just reach out and, and hold on to him. Isaiah 43, 1 through 3. Thus says the Lord God, he who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. The flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Fire and water. Flood and fire. Nothing's more devastating. And, 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 and right now, we've been devastated. And, and, and more than us, Kim has been devastated. Jonathan, Joshua, Lydia, they, they are experiencing tremendous, tremendous pain. Don't fear. For I am the Lord your God. One more. Again, our brother prayed about it. Best, blessed be the God and Father. First, Second Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. I learned about this verse very, very early in my life. I spent my high school and college years working at a Christian camp. Part of working at a Christian camp is campfires. On a particular night, the staff was having a campfire, and it was my responsibility to put out the fire when everyone was finished. Our time concluded. 
Everyone is leaving the campfire area. I'm waiting. I got my bucket. I got my water. I'm all set to put out the fire. One guy sitting there with his head bowed next to the fire. I knew Bob. I knew him well. We were from the same town. Three weeks earlier, his 13-year-old brother was killed in a bicycle accident. He sat there in silence. I was 18 years old. I had no idea what to do. I had no idea what to say. I sat down next to him, and I just sat there. And after a while, I, I, I simply said, Bob, I have no idea what you're going through. And he says, that's it. Everybody comes up to me and says, oh, Bob, I know what you're going through. I know what, he says, nobody knows. I had no clue what he was going through. I remember saying to him, Bob, you may not understand now, but someday God is going to use this in your life to comfort somebody else who's going through this. Two weeks later, I had a 13-year-old cousin killed in a car accident. After the funeral, after I came back to camp, Bob showed up in my room and he says, now I get it. We cried together, we prayed together. Here's my point. You've lost a pastor who has cared for you in so many different ways. Take that care and care for each other. Because he has taught you how to care by his caring. Take that care that he's taught you and care for his family. Because they're going to need so much care and so much love that our God grants through us as we serve one another. Thank you. We'll be worshiping together uh, in How Great Thou Art, and I'd like to invite everyone to stand and worship as joyfully and as contagiously as Pastor Gay would. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider Thank you. 
This time we're going to have a scripture reading by two brothers in Christ, Pastor Jeremy Bell and Pastor Brian Benagin. Well, hello, friends. Hello, family. Um, For seven years, I got the privilege of serving uh, with Pastor Gay here. Um, apparently, part of the job description was dressing up in a weird Egyptian outfit at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was still in the job description, but uh, during that time, I called him boss, I called him pastor, I called him friend, um, I called him mentor, I called him counselor. And uh, though I now pastor a church down in Orlando, Florida, um, he never stopped being pastor and friend and counselor and ministry dad. Um, I wanna share with you from Psalm 116. It says, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And he says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servant. For those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Brian Benog, and I was the student ministries pastor here um, for a while. And it's funny, sorry to be a little light, but it's funny because three people have come up and read the verse that I'm about to read to you. And I, if Pastor Gay was here, I would go back to his office, and depending on whether or not I had coffee or not, I might be grumpy, or I might just be like, what's going on? Um, and I know he would remind me that if the Lord is saying something several times over, it's an important thing for all of us to know. And I want to, um, specifically for my family here at Central, that um, if you're going to be a church that is going to bring hope to the hurting, allow the Lord to heal you in this time so that you can do that. <clears throat> Paul tells us, all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us along, alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. And we all get a full measure of that, too. Well, 
What will it be like when my pain is gone and all the worries of this world just fade away? What will it be like when you call my name and that moment when I see you face to face? Waiting my whole life to hear you say, Well done, well done, my good and faithful one. Welcome to the place where you belong. Reflections of a Life Well Lived to the Glory of God by Pastor Dan Gay, Rendell Friend, and Ryan Alden. I wasn't sure this morning as I woke up 
where God wanted me to go with this. I had something prepared, but honestly, a celebration of life was the last thing on my mind when I woke up this morning. So I reached out to the second and third most important pastors in my life because the first most important pastor in my life was no longer there. And that's what it felt like. But I got to tell you, I actually even said to my wife, I said, I don't know what they're going to get. I don't know. Hang on. We'll see what's going on here. <laughs> But as I stood in that receiving line and I heard the stories, stories of premarital counseling, stories of marriages, stories of funerals being done, stories of impact, stories of people coming and saying, he changed my life. Stories of people saying, he showed me Jesus. It was my pleasure to hear and to see the impact my brother has had on you. And I want to tell you, on behalf of all of my siblings and my mom, he loved you. You see, what, what you may not know is when my brother came here to Central, came up back to the Northeast after being in Texas, he was broken, he was hurt. And you as a church helped pull him together and you were willing to let him pull you together for the glory of God. So he loved you when we heard stories, all of us, about what's going on and what's happening and how excited he is. And not just for today, because as you know, my brother was always looking down the line, anticipating, expecting what's next. What's God got next? And it's more than appropriate that his last message was about hope, because that's what he brought. That's the impact he had. So we share with you the grief and the sorrow and the loss that you're feeling. But I talked with Pastor Anthony and I said, okay, what are, you, what, what are you looking for from this time? He said, well, I want you to humanize him. I'm the little brother, right? You don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> How many opportunities do I get like this, right? But as I was listening for God and saying, okay, God, what, what do you want them to hear? What do they have? What do you have for them? There were two things that just kept coming back to me, and that's what I want to focus on. But I felt God was telling me is they will see my son Jesus, as you share how he lived and how he loved. So that's where I'm going to go. Now, a lot of you must think, wow, what an amazing thing to grow up with Pastor Richard. Oh, the grace, the blessing. Every day must have been like a Disney movie with birds flying around and talking to you. What an amazing opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> if we'd have grown up with Pastor Richard. <laughs> but we did it. <laughs> We grew up with somebody completely different. <laughs> My siblings and I, as we grew up, we were the six Ds, okay? Dick, as we knew him, Denise, Donna, 
Danny, who I was growing up, Diana, and Darlene. And so say that five times fast, right? <laughs> My mom sounded like she was speaking in tongues when she called us for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't grow up with Pastor Richard. We grew up with King Richard I. <laughs> you see, he... <laughs> He was the firstborn, and he never let us forget that. <laughs> I'm in charge. Mom says you got to listen to me. You got to do what I say. And so he would, he would lord over us and tell us what to do, when to do, where to do, how to do it. That was King Richard I. <laughs> and I can remember times. Now, the rest of us, five Ds, did not make it easy on him. That wasn't our job. <laughs> My sister Denise, the eldest sister, fought him at every turn, every chance she got. <laughs> there she is, see, and she knows it. Hey, one of the problems we do not have is the 60s is we are self-aware. So <laughs> we can own it. And as you've heard my brother preach, he owns it as well. Second sister, Donna, was just looking to try to keep the peace between this rival, between my brother and my sister. Me, as the little brother, I, my job was to create chaos. <laughs> and to make everybody laugh. So I figured if I could do both, I'd be all right. Diana, the third sister, was quietly, and I mean quietly, watching and taking it all in and forming her own opinions that clearly we were all mad. <laughs> and the youngest, Darlene, was doing what the youngest do, using the chaos to get her own way. Because <laughs> that's what the youngest do. So he would tell us what to do, what not to do. I can remember a time that I was learning to write. And so I was at home writing. And my brother would come by and he would say, you know, you're, the way you're supposed to hold a pencil, come on, it's a pencil, right? <laughs> is you should hold it lightly enough that it could just be taken out of your hand. So I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm working on it. He comes by three, four times, keeps taking it out of my hand. <laughs> nope, nope. See, that's good, Dan. That's good. You're, you're letting go of it. Well, here's the thing, okay? I got stubborn and I grabbed that pencil and clinched around it so that the next time he tried, it just made my hand go up and hit him, right? Well, to this day, I get cramps if I write too long because I hold my pencil too hard. <laughs> King Richard I. He was an instigator. He would go into, my four sisters were in one room, he and I shared uh, a separate room, a small room in bunk beds, and he would go over and he would go right up to the entrance of the door and literally put his foot over the entrance. Which of, calls, of course calls my sister Denise to scream, Mom, he's in my room, he's in my room! To which my brother would put his foot back and go, no, I'm not. <laughs> An instigator. That was King Richard I. But see, it all changed. All of us siblings, though we have never belonged to any of his churches, consider him our pastor. So how did he go? How did he go from King Richard I to Pastor Dick for us? And I've been thinking about that. And as I thought about it, the, what changed was Jesus got a hold of his heart. See, when Jesus got a hold of his heart, it changed everything. He was no longer looking to dominate and control over. He was looking to serve. Pride was replaced with humility when Jesus got a hold of his heart. When Jesus got a hold of his heart, rather than intent on leading in where we were going, when we were going, when we were going to get there, because my brother always had an agenda, that got replaced with grace. That got replaced with care. 
that got replaced with shepherding. And those are the stories that I heard today. How he made a difference. How he made an impact. And his impact wasn't made on this stage. His impact was made with each of you. As I heard those stories. When Jesus gets a hold of your heart, it changes everything. He wasn't a pastor because of his education. He wasn't a pastor because of his certifications. He was a pastor because Jesus got a hold of his heart. And when I think about that, I want to read this verse. It says, You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. That's what happens when Jesus gets a hold of your heart. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish and put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God that I may tell of all your works. When Jesus gets a hold of your heart, it moves from what you know about Jesus to how you're living for him. It's what makes the church, Big C, the church, his body. That's what I saw from my brother. And I want to close reading you the words of a song from Rich Mullins. And I think this describes my brother extremely well. So if I stand, let me stand on the promise that you will pull me through. And if I can't, let me fall on the grace that first brought me to you. And if I sing, let me sing for the joy that is born in me these songs. And if I weep, let it be as a man who is longing for his home. Well, I don't have any King Richard stories, because I came much later than King Richard was known. Uh, my name is Ryan Alden. My brother, Rendell Friend, is here with me today as my emotional support as we share a little bit about what it was like to live with Uncle Dick in our, our household. Um, you know, I, I would say that we started in, in, our, in our own way. Uh, every wedding, counseling session, any moment of grief, we knew who was going to take care of it for us. There was never a question on who was going to step up for our family. And I got to see this life that you see this man as a pastor be what we affectionately called Uncle Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment where we, we knew that he was going to lead us. See, I got to see a man that truly loved his family, his extended family, his immediate family. He loved those that were surrounded with him. There was never an awkward moment with Uncle Dick. You never felt awkward spending time with him. There, whether you were struggling inside your own heart, you weren't sure what was next for you, he had words of encouragement, and if he didn't have the words, he knew how to listen. I remember as a little kid, I, I was, I'm the second oldest cousin, so the first oldest male cousin, which is uh, <laughs> bragging right on its own. Uh, but I remember as a little kid, when my family, the boisterous family that we are, would get together, us kids would just sit and listen to the stories.
and listen and listen to the laughter and listen to just those moments of good and bad that they walk through and they can turn around and say, wow, that was crazy. And then turn to us as kids and say, you're never doing that crazy. (laughs) And us as cousins, we have some secrets. (laughs) Um, But you know, when I got that call on Friday, the first thing that I thought was that smile and that laughter. Never forget that. See, we remember the little things. We remember the vacations, the time that we played games with each other when it got too competitive because all of us are competitors. (laughs) We remember the big things too. We remember the moments where his words of encouragement walked us into the next steps of our lives. Where he counseled us before our weddings where he stood in the gap when we were scared to be in there. He was always there when you needed him. He never chased, but he was always there. Mm -hmm. For us, that's an example of, of a godly man. He led our family with authenticity authentic relationships. He never hid who he was. And he led himself with integrity. I never had to doubt what was going on with him. Paul says this in 2 Timothy. He says this, a soldier is not concerned by civilian matters, but instead is only interested in the one that enlisted him. And to me, So often we can look at his role as a pastor and say this is where he was enlisted. For us, he was a leader of our family. He was enlisted there first before anywhere else. He owned that truth and grace. What a legacy. Thank you for coming today. We invite you to stand and sing and worship God with us with Pastor Gay's, one of his favorite hymns, It Is Well With My Soul.
thank you to the family who shared those precious words about King Richard the first. <laughs> I would tell you that there was only a few people that worked with him that got a chance to see the glimpse of King Richard the first. Some of us did, you know. It was when we went out bowling and we watched the football game. <laughs> Yeah, out of nowhere, I'd be like, who is this person, you know? <laughs> you know? But my job this morning or this afternoon was to share with you um, what great man of God he really was, to eulogize him, which is to speak well of him. And that's why it was so important that we would hear the fact that he was a good husband, a good father, uncle, and friend to us. And so thank you so much for sharing those stories. They meant a lot to us. You know, 11 years ago, about 11 years ago, um, I had put in my application to become pastor of spiritual development here at Central. The Lord made it clear to my wife and I that it was time for us to leave our church home in Delaware. I was currently working as the pastor of administration and so I had put my application in, and Pastor Gay came down to my home uh, to interview me. And I remember us having this conversation about the needs of the church. But what was most important to him, he said, is that, that I need the time to be able to prioritize my family first. He said, my family comes first. And I need somebody to help me out at the church to help pastor the people at the church. And out of nowhere, Pastor Gay began to weep uncontrollably. Now, this was sort of my first experience with Pastor Gay, so I didn't know what to do. I, I mean, he's sitting at my dining room table. I didn't know whether to hug him or to apologize. Like, I'm sorry. I, what, what did I say? I thought to myself, I lost this job. It's not happening, <laughs> right? My wife had came home later on that afternoon, late that afternoon, and she said, you know, she was curious to find out what happened, you know, what happened in the end. I said, well, I think it went well. You know, we were talking, and, and then he started crying, and my wife was like, hold on, hold, hold on. <laughs> you know, her facial expression moved from, from, uh, moved from being real glad to now being concerned about me, and she had this look on her face, and she began to say, wait a minute, he was crying? And I said, yeah, he started crying. She said, well, what did you say to the man to make him start crying? And I was like, well, look, don't get on me. I said, we were just having a conversation, right? And over time, we got a chance to really know that Pastor Gay cries during Hallmark commercials, right? Right? But those tears were always sincere. He really did deeply care about people. When I became the pastor of spiritual development and I learned to love him, not only as my pastor, but truly as my brother in Christ. And as I continued to work with him, work together as co-laborers in Christ, I found that he truly was a shepherd after God's own heart. That's right, a shepherd after God's own heart. First to his family as a loving husband and father, and then to us and to the body of Christ. You know, Pastor Gay followed the example of his good shepherd. The same shepherd that laid down his life for him, he laid down his life for us, and that is Jesus Christ. And, and it was said that that's what made him the great man of God, that he really was because of his personal relationship that he had with Jesus Christ. He was a good man that, that had a personal relationship with the Lord, and he truly ran his race well. And I know that he would have wanted this to be a celebration, but I also know that he would want me to challenge you. See, his legacy challenges us to run our race in a way that we would be disciples after God's own heart. And so for just a few moments, I'd like to share with you a passage of Scripture that we find in Matthew chapter 9. 
we have it on the screen, and some of you may have some electronic devices that you can pull up the verses to follow along with me. Because I really do believe that he would want us to learn and live as disciples after God's own heart. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So Jesus not only visited the wealthy cities, but also these small, quaint towns, these obscure villages. He didn't just confine his kindness and his goodness to his own town, but he spread this love and this good news all throughout Galilee. We know that he had now been traveling through these towns, and these are towns that he had frequent before. We know that because in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, he specifically um, almost quotes this particular passage of Scripture word by word. And so Jesus had now been making this rotation going to the villages, going to these synagogues, and no doubt his reputation would have preceded himself. And so people got the word that Jesus is now coming in town. They would have been gathering together, waiting for him. The crowds began to swell, and the disciples in their mind were thinking, well, this has been a long day. We've traveled a long ways. Their feet might have been filled with blisters, and they had worked hard to control and manage the crowds that would lean up towards Jesus. No doubt they were thinking, let's just pack it up for the day and, and let's move on. But the, Jesus, but the scripture says here in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The disciples were probably thinking like they had thought on other occasions to let's just send the people away. It's been a long day. But Jesus now sees these people as being helpless, as being sheep without a shepherd. They were troubled, beaten down, and weary. Jesus always saw the people. When he traveled through the towns, Many people would ignore the different people that were struggling and hurting, and, and someone reached out and grabbed his garment, and this woman had an issue of blood, and Jesus pauses and said, who hey, touched me? And he heals her immediately. It was Jesus who would walk through the dusty roads of Jericho, and as thousands of people gathered, no one would pay attention to this man, this little man in a tree. But Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house tonight. Even in his own town, Jesus would travel and he would watch people walk to the other side of the road because there was a tax collector's booth. But it was Jesus that would step into this tax collector's booth and say, Matthew, come on and follow me. See, Jesus looked beyond our faults to see our needs. Jesus saw the need. You know, we live... In a day and age where pastors are now celebrities, they preach a message with the strobe light on their face. They might not even see the congregation. They'll exit stage right and you won't see them until next week. But that wasn't Pastor Gay. All of us know that after the sermon, Pastor Gay would eagerly look to see the people's needs. He would take about four steps forward right here and, and he would begin to lean in and speak to you. And when you spoke to him, you know that you had his full attention. He wasn't looking over your shoulder. He would spend time with you trying to find out what your need is. So much so that I used to tell him after the service, nobody knew. I said, listen, you got to step back because you're causing a traffic jam in the aisle. There's other people that, we can, that can pray with people, you know. <laughs> and then I remember him telling me, he said, he said Anthony, I can't help it. I just lean into people. That was the kind of man that he was. He was a shepherd after God's own heart. He was one who cared about people's needs. He saw people. I remember sitting in his office and having a conversation with him. I was 
troubled with some things. I had that mask on that we all put on when we try to hold up and be strong. But somehow he could see right through it. And he began to ask me questions, making me feel vulnerable. I had this lump in my throat. And then he said, well, maybe there's a little boy inside that needs affirmation from his father. And I, my eyes welled up with water. I'm like, oh, what's happening to me? You know? <laughs> Many of you may know that he was going to be getting his degree in the Masters of Science in Counseling this spring. But if you've ever sat across Pastor Gay, you know that God had already anointed him with this, this doctorate of counseling, right? Man. It seemed that he could see right to the need. And God had anointed him with this ability to be able to diagnose whatever was wrong with you. Begin to prescribe with, to you a word of encouragement so that you would leave his office with your head up and not with your head down. That was the pastor that we know. He was a man who saw the need. Jesus wants us to be a community of people that see each other and not look over each other. He wants us to care for one another. In this passage of scripture, verse 36, he says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. In this verse, we see Jesus' motivation behind what he was doing. Many of us do good works, but sometimes for the wrong reasons. We do it maybe to be seen. We might do it because it might make us feel better. It becomes a little bit self-serving. But the Greek word that's used here means that this is for a person who was moved deeply in their inner parts, their guts. And so the passage of Scripture, we see that Jesus was moved deeply with compassion in his inner parts for these people. He loved and cared for these people. He did not angrily blame them for the mess that they were in, nor did he judge them like the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He wasn't a critic, but instead he looked beyond their faults and, and all the mess to, to look to see their needs and then feel their need. You know, today we have global news networks and social media sites that keep us up to date about the news on a, on a regular basis, 24-7. And in that we find that there are people suffering all over the world. You'll find that as you look through the news, there may be a child abduction in another state. There could be people who are suffering in anguish in war-torn countries. You'll see that looking on these news networks, that there's widespread pain, disease, famine. By no fault of our own, I believe that somehow this sort of gives us the, intent, the, the tendency to become desensitized to what's going on around us. We don't quite feel it. Jesus not only saw the need, but he felt the need. Pastor Gay never seemed to be desensitized by the pain of other people. God had worked in him that he, he really felt deeply about people's pain and he would be willing to lean into their pain, to love them in the midst of it. He felt deeply and passionately about his family. He loved Kim deeply. He was there for his family and he loved them. The Lord sort of wired him to lean into people's struggles, wired him in a way that he would inquire about how you were feeling because he truly wanted to know. That's why he just did not offer uh, celebrate recovery here at Central. He would facilitate the groups. He didn't just make sure that we would offer grief share here at Central. Last summer, he was facilitating grief share. He just didn't have concern about people that needed mental health support groups. Uh, 
He facilitated and started a like-minded where people can get support through difficult times like that. He leaned into people's sorrows, their pains, their struggles. Whatever we do for Christ should flow from a compassionate heart. That we feel people. That we love people. And he would want us to live courageously as we leaned into people's pain and suffering and walk with them. Look at verse 37. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus now changes the metaphor. He begins this, uh, this particular passage here saying that people are not only like sheep that are in need of a shepherd, but those who are lost were like wheat that can be harvested. So Jesus was this good shepherd that loved the sheep, but he also demonstrated what it looked like to be a worker that would go after the harvest. There are three primary seasons of the harvest. There is the spring harvest, and during that time, you would harvest barley and grain. There's the summer harvest, where you would harvest the wheat. And then there's the fall harvest, where you would gather grapes and fruit. But if you were a farmer that did not have laborers that would be able to go out and get the harvest, the food would spoil and would go to waste. But Jesus now demonstrates what I call the ministry of presence. That's why he went from town to town and village to village. He wanted the disciples to see that he was present. So not only did Jesus see the need, not only did he feel the need, but he met the need. He had this ministry of presence. Pastors, Pastor Gay first ensured that he was present at home for his family. That was the top priority as a staff member here. He let us all know that we have to be home with our families first. That ministry of presence starts at home and then works into the church. But it starts at home first. He loved his wife. He was so proud of Lydia, Josh, and Jonathan. He was proud of you, and he would want you to know that he was proud and proud of you. He loved you all so deeply. You were his first priority. He cared about the church community, the local and global community. That's why he preached and he taught with power and strength. Pastor Gay was a man who taught with grace and truth wherever he went. He wasn't a pastor that just sat home reading a bunch of books and then took a dozen speaking engagements throughout the country. No, he was present with us. Yeah, we had a pastor that was here. He would spend time with you and care for you. He demonstrated to us this ministry of presence. He was present in our community for the fire department, for the police department. He was a man who wanted to lean into people, know, get to know people, and then do whatever possible to actually meet those needs. There, were, there was even people that you probably weren't familiar with. And it didn't matter to him whether these were people who had big titles or not. We received a phone call here at the office. And the phone call was from a lady who was suffering from terminal brain cancer right here in our community. Pastor Gay came into my office and he said, listen, we received this phone call of somebody who has terminal brain cancer. He says, I'm not familiar with the name. He said, are you familiar who this is? And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know who that is. So he said, let's go over there tomorrow. He made room on his schedule, and we both went to this lady's home. It was a small home, and I remember when we knocked on the door, she opened up the door. We can see visibly that she was receiving treatment. Her hair, uh, she had lost her hair. One of her eyes was shut, and she had a, sort of a growth on the side of her face. 
and we immediately felt compassion for her. She began to lead us into the living room, and I noticed that there was writings all over the walls. She had poster boards put up all on the walls, and as she began to lead us through the living room, because she said, I want us to sit outside on the patio, back patio, I quickly began to read some of the things that I was seeing, and I noticed that these were reminders for her on where to find her keys, reminders for her when she was supposed to take her medication. And as we went out into her back patio, Pastor Gay sat next to her on this little bench. I sat across from them, and I watched Pastor Gay grab her hand ever so gently. He began to listen to her pain, and then he began to share with her the good news of Jesus Christ. He began sharing the gospel to her, and he explained to her that there was hope beyond this earth, that beyond this world, that she could have hope eternal if she would just trust Jesus. He explained to her that we were all helpless sheep in need of a savior, but there was a good shepherd that would die for us. He made it so clear and plain to her that she immediately accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Amen. Not long after that, she went home to be with the Lord, and I had the pleasure and honor of officiating her homegoing service with Pastor Gay. It was a beautiful thing. See, Jesus planned a harvest that he calls us to be laborers of the gospel. Pastor Gay saw the need. He, he felt the need. But he also met the need by sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew that that's where people can find real hope when they were hurting. See, he was a shepherd after God's own heart. His legacy challenges us to be people who see the need, to be people who would feel the need, and people who would meet that need. In a book entitled, A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd Psalm, Philip Keller, who was the author, he begins to give a description of what it's like to be a shepherd. He would know what it was like to be a shepherd because he grew up the son of a missionary in Kenya. And so he lived his life watching shepherds and watching how they interact with the sheep. And he begins to give a, a scenario that he said that would frequently happen. And that was that the sheep would sometimes climb on the side of a mountain and they would lose their balance and topple over. And when the sheep would topple over, they would fall on their backs. And their little legs would be flailing in the air. And there was no way for that sheep to be able to turn itself over. And he described this as being sheep that was cast down. And no matter how hard the, the sheep would shake their legs and flail in the air, they could not save themselves. But if there was a good shepherd, a good shepherd would come alongside and, and help the sheep up on its feet and there's a good shepherd that we need because when you look at our hearts you'll see that it's cast down and no matter how hard we try to work and struggle to to get right we can't do it without him and pastor gay shared with us two weeks ago about the hope that we have in jesus christ because the good shepherd got on that cross for you. The good shepherd was the one who got up three days later as a receipt that says that the payment is good. The good shepherd gives us the promise that only he can extricate us from our sins, set us right if we just trust in him. It was the good news of the good shepherd that helped Pastor Gabe be the man that he was. And it's the good news for us that will help us to be the church that God would have us to be. Perhaps you're asking questions to yourself, thinking, how can this be? And I don't understand. 
I want to provide an opportunity for you. One, I'm going to pray for you before we finish. And, and two, I want to just share with you an opportunity for you to ask questions. You may have doubts about your faith. You may be struggling about, you know, what this all means. And Pastor Gay would always say, you know what, this is a place where you should get your questions answered. And so on May 12th, we have something called Starting Point, and we want to encourage you to come here at 9.30 a.m., and we welcome all you to come with all your doubts and all your questions. And we'll sit and just talk with you, just like Pastor Gay would have done. We just want you to know that this is good news. So on May 12th, we encourage you to come to that. It's only about an hour, and it's an open discussion just to talk about faith and who Christ was and is to us. That's what I really believe that Pastor Gay would have wanted us to do. See, Pastor Gay was a shepherd after God's own heart. He really was. But just think, last Friday, he stepped out on shore and found that he was in heaven. He reached out and touched a hand and found it was God's. He breathed in new air and found that it was celestial. Yeah, he woke up in glory and found that he was home. <laughs> Pastor Gay is home. He's home and so we can celebrate that today. Amen? We can cry and weep because we miss him, but we can also cry tears of joy because we know where he is celebration of his life and he would call us to be disciples after God's own heart let's pray Heavenly Father we just thank you God we thank you for this man's life the 62 years that he sh that you shared him with us God God we thank you Lord he was such a great man but God we know that you would have pointed everyone to you, the good shepherd that laid down his life for the sheep. So I ask that you would right now begin to work in the hearts of someone who may not have a personal relationship with you. God, I ask that you would hear their cry. I ask that you would just touch them so that they would even take that first step, that next step in starting point. God, I ask that you would just move by your spirit to help us to be the church that you called us to be that we would use his life to challenge us to complete that legacy of seeing people, complete the legacy of feeling people and feeling for people, God, and, and then help us, God, to meet the needs of people for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.
be seated for just a moment. Um, before I give the benediction, I want to say to the gay family, um, I now sort of be, speak on behalf of the central family as well as the friends, that we want you to know that however you want to be loved, however you want to be cared for, we respect your wishes and desires so that you can grieve in a way that allows you the space and comfort to mourn. And we love you. We're going to continue to pray for you. And I think I believe that I know what you all would want to say. And so I want you to repeat after me as you speak to them. We love you. We love you. And we're praying for you. Praying. We truly do. And I, I can tell you sincerely from the bottom of my heart that whatever we can do to comfort you, we're here for you. But we're going to give you the space so that you can do that however you desire. God bless you. At this time, I'm going to ask that, uh, um, that you all would remain seated. I'm going to give the benediction, um, and then I'll give you some further instructions from there. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for faith. We believe, God, that you've given us the faith to believe in you so that we might have a relationship with you. God, help us to continue to believe. God, we thank you for the hope, the hope that Pastor Gay preached two Sundays ago. God, we thank you because in that hope that we know that we can see tomorrow, and God, I ask that you would now empower us with love. For you said a new commandment I give unto you, that we would love one another. So God, I ask that that love would be poured in and through us so that we might love one another and comfort one another. Now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask that you would remain seated, and for the family, you may now exit uh, to the front um, so you can come out, come through back this way, or if you'd like, you can also exit from the rear. So whatever you prefer, you can do that. Amen. Let's give them a hand for making it through today. Amen. Amen. Yep, you can. Come on. Come on. Amen. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. At this time, we'd also like to uh, thank Apple Wilson for their services, and we also would, I'm going to leave the rest of the officiating in his capable hands.
Thank you. This now concludes our services here for Pastor Gay. The cemetery we will, will be held privately at a later date. Uh, however, the family would love for you to join them uh, for luncheon today. It will be held in Allen Hall. You may make your way there now. If it fills up, there will be staff there to guide you to other areas. So thank you very much, and you may take your leave.